WCNC Charlotte. This is Flashpoint, where power and politics collide and the tough questions get asked and answered. Thanks for joining us here on Flashpoint. I'm Ben Thompson. The city of Charlotte will now require the vaccine for new workers. It comes as leaders say 70% of the city staff is now vaccinated. After offering incentives, the city did see a boost in vaccinations. Take a look. The department's seen the biggest jumps Charlotte Fire, Charlotte Water, Aviation, and CMPD. Workers who don't get vaccinated could face some consequences. Joining us this morning, Charlotte City Councilman Tark Bakari and Larkin Eggleston. Gentlemen, thank you for coming on. Glad to be here. Uh, Tark, I'll begin with you. Um, the city said it had hoped to reach 75% of vaccination among workers, and, and we still might get there, but we're not there yet. Um, what happens to those workers who are not getting vaccinated? Well, that's that's what we're going to find out, right? And I, we were on the show probably a month or two or three ago when we announced, had just announced the the competition where we were giving incentives away, which I didn't think was that great of an idea. It, it's had some results, as we've seen. More people have gotten it. But now we're, we're kind of probably at that point where we're close to those who were putting it off or whatever. And, and now we're at the final grouping of folks who have a reason. And I know for anecdotal examples, some of those reasons are incredibly valid. Folks with, you know, preconditions that, that um, have immune uh, deficiencies, um, cancer survivors, things like that, that have those questions. And then there are others that are simply probably looking at it and saying, you know, with all vaccines, there is risk and I need to make that decision. Um, it isn't something that I just do without making a decision. So, you know, wh while the vaccine is certainly something that helps us, the more people that have it, the better, uh, you know, it's a slippery slope we're on right now. And as you see with what the announcement was from the manager and, and kind of where we are, it's exactly where I thought it was heading in that meeting where we talked about it a few months ago, which is um, they're kind of teetering on this edge of starting now saying no new employees are going to be hired that aren't vaccinated. And that's going to evolve quickly then to the, to the next step, which is are we going to fire people that don't have it? And I think that's ridiculous because are we going to fire people next year that don't have the second booster or the year after that who don't get a third shot? I mean, this is a new normal and we have to act accordingly. Still, we're talking about in some cases when you break it down by department, you're talking about some you know public facing departments in, in many cases. While we said that the departments are uh, like the police department, the fire department are seeing a big jumps in the last few months. Still, less than 60 percent of Charlotte firefighters uh, are vaccinated about two thirds of cats workers, two thirds of police. Uh, Larkin, I mean, these are these are public facing departments. These aren't people who are holed up in offices somewhere. These are people that are interacting with with the public on a daily basis. Yeah, I think there's a material difference between people who can work in isolation or can work from home um, and the people who are interacting with the public every day. And so that was one of the big concerns that some of our lower vaccination rates were among those folks who are interacting with, with customers and citizens every single day. So um, I, I certainly support the idea of if we're hiring new folks, we don't wanna bring in folks who are contributing to a challenge we already have, which is getting our vaccination rates up. Uh, and I, I can't fathom that there would be, um, that there would not be carve outs for people who have legitimate medical issues that would preclude them from getting the vaccine. So those those exist, those are real, and I think those will certainly be accounted for in anything that we do. Would you, either one of you, be open to what basically the county has, and that's uh, requiring proof of vaccination or weekly testing of all employees. Is, is that something, Tark, that, that you would be open to that you think is a fair sort of middle ground? And there has to be room for compromise like that or other things, as long as the protocols get um, you know, more efficient and, and ease of use kind of in their nature. Um, we have to, especially for fr frontline employees like that. But I I'll just go back to why this is just rubs me the wrong way. These are all the exact same people for almost two years that we've relied upon. We didn't say a word when we were sending them into danger when there was no vaccine and every day they did it. And now we're in this weird spot where it's like a almost like a PR move where we're where we're firing nurses and and debating, you know, are we going to fire fire department members and, and police police officers? And I think that's just ridiculous for how we've relied on them when, in fact, you know, the vaccine is a personal decision. I have it. I don't know why we have to run around and say anytime we say this, I have it, though, I have it. But I do. But I also believe that where there's risk, there's choice. And these folks, they, they have the right to make those choices. 
but at the end of the day, I think this can be solved easily. The, the mayor, the manager said, we're going to look at the Department of Labor and how they decide to handle reimbursement for testing and things like that for costs for us. If people make this decision, they should be on, have to sign away uh, exposure rights to be able to sue their employer or maybe their secondary priority when it comes to medical emergency facilities. And that's a trade off, but that's a decision they have to make. We shouldn't force people into one bucket. Larkin. Yeah, I think that it, to me, the, the difference is that it's not just a matter of personal risk, that it is a, a public risk when we've got people going out and interacting with folks in our community. And so I think that's where we have to look at it differently than someone who sits at a desk and could potentially do that job from home in isolation. So it, yes, there's some personal risk that people are allowed to assume, um, but when it starts to impact the, the folks that they engage with on a day-to-day -day basis, then I think we have to take those people into consideration too, because they are unknowingly being exposed to additional risk, um, not by their own choice. All right, let's talk about redistricting. Uh, this week's uh, redistricting uh, subcommittee of council held a listening session to hear from neighbors about their concerns or questions with the new maps. We've talked about it here on Flashpoint many times. Uh, the committee working on drawing new district lines in Charlotte after the release of that new census data that came out and, and, and lots of growth here in the city in the last 10 years. Right now, the committee has three maps they're considering, none of them really making too big a change. Uh, um, this has been the source of, I know, um, heated rhetoric in the past, um, Tark, since, since this is something that you've been uh, sort of in the public sphere about talking back and forth. Um, I'll start with you. Has, has this gotten unnecessarily heated? I mean, the maps have not changed that much. And I, and I know you'll make the case that, that's, yeah, because I've drawn attention to it, but, um, was it worth all, all, all the, the, the fuss? Yeah, I, I think it was incredibly unnecessarily uh, um, political and nasty uh, where it didn't need to be. But I go back to what you just said is, is if I hadn't done what, what I did right when I saw what the chairman Malcolm Graham was doing in the beginning, taking away the criteria for our consultants to consider um, political major political party balanced in in the redrawing of the maps basically saying few moves is possible which few moves is possible equals gerrymandering because there's no other way in as few moves as possible given the geographic setup of charlotte to 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 not stack and pack district six with democrat precincts therefore going closer to a 10 to 1 balance when in reality we should have you know two safe Republican seats and another potentially four toss up seats that could go Republican. So uh, Malcolm Graham got his hand caught in the cookie jar right up front. And ultimately now we have three maps, only the first one, which we would have had three flavors of the first map had I not done what I'd done in the beginning. Um, the first still, one still, is the one that let, has- let, 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 Just let me interrupt you real quick because I think you also called him a hack at one point, which I mean, uh, Having covered city council, having covered the, your predecessors, Annie Doolin and, and Kitty Smith there in, in the chamber for years myself, I mean, it's sort of a body that sort of pride, prided itself in being relatively civil over the years. Um, I mean, was it necessary to get to that point of rhetoric? No. Uh, and again, I, I, I said those words in, in a ill-timed interview with Axios the morning after the end of a contentious, you know, month, months, months long debate over the comprehensive 2040 comp plan, uh, where, you know, yeah, I, I, I call a spade a spade. I wish I hadn't done that. I did it. Uh, it doesn't make me feel like I said something. I'm, I'm not going to say no, I don't believe that in my heart. It's just, you're right. Uh, decorum of history would have said, don't call Malcolm Graham a political hack. So, you know, I am sorry about that. Okay. Tark has a tendency to be a little dramatic, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is you couldn't, if you let Tark draw the map by himself, you couldn't draw four toss-up districts in addition to two Republican safe seats. Not true. There, there's under 20% Republicans in this community. Now, granted, unaffiliated is, is you know, the fastest growing party across the country. That unaffiliated voters tend to vote Democratic in our community. So it is not... There's nothing unfair about the fact that our council is nine Democrats and two Republicans. Um, but And I do think that there's merit to saying we don't want to change the map any more than we have to, but that can't be the only criteria. So there were a number of criteria that were considered. I think we have maps now that are fair. Should there be an eighth district seat? Probably. Um, and that could be in addition to the seats we have now, or it could be 
um, taking away an at-large seat and making it an eighth district seat. So we could add one person to the council total, uh, or we could keep it at 11 and just shift the makeup of district to at-large. But I do think so, because now these districts are gonna be ballpark 125,000 folks each. Some of them right now are over 140,000 people. Um, and it's just not, people cannot be as effective representing that large um, of, a, of a population base as they could be if they were representing um, you know, proportionately less. Do you think, I think that it makes more sense to have more district seats? Do you think the full council will will make that call? I know Malcolm Graham has said, head of this subcommittee has it, said, it won't happen this time. There's okay. there's almost zero chance it happens this time. But I think it's something that needs to be considered in the future. Tark. Yeah, I just I, the bottom line is you can draw a map that's more fairly representative and not suppressing Republican votes by going to ten district seats and one at large seat there's no reason for us to have four at large folks you can make claims all day oh they're for strategic views and we have the micro view we all have the exact same strategic workload we just have to handle 125,000 constituent uh, requests and needs and concerns while they don't you took 10 district seats you could carve out two uh, tight Republican ones and four that could be close to toss up even uh, and that would be realistic and it would fit the needs of our city better and to the to the Malcolm question you know here's what I think is most important there Larkin has been handed leadership roles like over the public safety committee topics of the last year and he navigated through those really well we all I've been given opportunities to lead and redesign the arts approach and how we fund arts in this community and we got through some very tricky situations this was as as much of a teed up shot of anything of hold a committee listen to the public and let the consultants draw some maps there was no reason for any kind of drama or problem around this and it just shows this is going to haunt Malcolm for a while that when given leadership leadership opportunities, no matter how small, he ends up creating a, 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 a circus that we all have to then go through. Larkin, I'll let you respond. Tark says he regrets um, the name the calling, the Larkin, the, the name lack calling. of decorum and then does it again. So I, hey, you, it's one it. thing to call names. It's another thing to cite facts. All right, gentlemen, stay with us. More Flashpoint after this. Monday.